Hello. Over here. I don't know. No, more. No more. Oh. Um, I don't know. Some of you may have heard, because sometimes I run into you guys at school, and I talk to a few people. Um, well, I think I sent you guys an email, and I tried to ask everybody if I had you guys come in the last week on your Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday day, um, if people could be at the school. And I haven't heard anything, any feedback that says people can't. So, and I, I did get permission today. I talked to Dr. Ritz and I talked to the other teachers because what I would like to do <clears throat> moving ahead, like next week is week seven. So that'll be the normal format. Um, that it'll be our last lecture. So then our final would be on Monday, a week from Monday, which is, let me get my calendar up here. Um, the 24th, Monday the 24th is the Monday of week eight. So we would meet, or we would do our final. Then on that Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, I would want you to come in. Um, I might say come in at one instead of 12. Um, normally I think I start with you guys at 1230 or I was supposed to, we just never did it that way. Um, but I might say <clears throat> just for a couple hours, I don't even know if we would use the full two hours. It wouldn't be like a full three hours. Um, but what I want to do is I have a checklist and it's anesthetist's responsibilities. Like if you're, now this is just for me, this is not an official surgery. I just typed up, if I'm an anesthetist, I walked through my brain on paper and I'm like pre-op, did I check blood work? Did I get my catheter set up? Did I get my tubes? Do I have my fluids? Intra-op, how is my patient doing? Am I recording? Is my patient needing pain meds? And then post-op, did I take my dog's temp? Did I recover? So it's kind of just like a, it's like a list. And then my goal is, if you are the anesthetist, say, you know, next week you're the anesthetist, you should read through that list and say, am I comfortable doing everything on this list? Am I comfortable with leak testing? Am I comfortable with the drugs? Am I comfortable with how to put in a catheter? <clears throat> that way, you know what you're responsible for and you can take it upon yourself to make sure you're prepared. So hopefully that makes sense. And then what I thought I'd do is I'd go through that list I'd have a machine. I have a way to hook up the machine to a breathing system and I can make a fake patient where you have to inflate the cuff. You can bag the patient so you guys get a feel for like inflating a cuff, filling a bag. Um, I might try to bring in a monitor to kind of show you guys the monitor. Um, so just some kind of like hands-on stuff before you start surgery that next week. Um, so, if anybody <clears throat> has a particular, I would like everybody there. I'm, I'm not going to, to be honest, I mean, you would have to be in my class anyway, but technically I always just have you guys watch a video. So, yeah, I, and, and Ray, I'm glad, I mean, the goal is to just, you know, it's the week before, we're kind of almost pushing you out of the nest, so it's kind of like, Here's your last, and um, yeah, and Michaela, I can kind of go through the monitor. Um, we can try to get a dog. I mean, we can try to get a dog out from the kennel even and potentially hook it up to the EKG, the blood pressure, or I'm just gonna kind of like turn it on and show you um, in person what it's doing. Um, so that'll be, so I'll send an, an email closer to kind of remind everybody, but I just want you to know week eight, I'd like you in the building on my day on either your Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And then, you know, that Friday, um, I don't know what they're going to have you do. 
Um, but I will be done with you on Thursday and the final, and the stuff that we do on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday <clears throat> is not for a grade, but that doesn't mean I don't want you there. I would expect everybody to be there. So if you're already thinking it's not for a grade, free day, don't show up. Just think about how important I think anesthesia is. And um, Ashlyn, I think it'll be um, a little bit like maybe not right at 1230, maybe one to three, you know, yeah. Cause the hard part is I get done, I need a little bit of time to set up and I don't get done with anatomy until noon. And I'd like to potentially eat something, kind of decompress from anatomy, and then I can get some stuff set up. Um, and that'll give us some time. So right now I'll say one to three. Contact me privately if you have an issue. Um, but if not, I'll just, I'll plan on seeing everybody. Now when you guys, let me just let you also know, I, I don't know if you got a copy of the surgery packet in surgical nursing from Zuber, but you guys get like a packet that will go through like the drug list and it'll go through responsibilities. But the sheet I made is like a two page, just a quick little checklist format to just be something quick to like refer to. I mean, obviously I don't grade you in that class and you need to go by duties but this is, you know, duties that they have you do, but this is just an extra sheet to be like, um, help get you prepared. Okay, um, let me go ahead and try and bring up some things about um, what we did this week, which is, and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm behind on my grading, so I gotta get stuff graded for your, um, exotic stuff and I my goal is to get all that entered this weekend <clears throat> get that test finished um grading but I think this is probably one of the most important lectures because it really goes through um you know is this chat screen in the way of you guys being able to see the PowerPoint I don't know what screen you're looking at so I just didn't know. Okay, I just wanna make sure. Um, so what I was looking for on those questions that I posted to the discussion board, the four reasons for anesthetic problems. Some people put like four patient factors, but it was human error, um, equipment failure, the adverse effects and increased risk. So the whole lecture was based on these categories. Um, and, you know, you always have to be prepared. And I think the biggest thing I want you guys to know, when you're an anesthetist, and I know the first time you go in there, you're going to be, you know, nervous. Obviously, you're probably going to be a little intimidated. And a lot of students, which is very common, are afraid to be wrong, are afraid to say something and they don't want to be judged, and they don't want to feel like they look stupid. Um, personally, if people make you feel that way, I 100% want to know about it because nobody should be made to feel stupid if you ask a question. Um, what I can summarize for you, when I have had anesthetic emergencies and anesthetic problems, I've had a gut feeling something was falling out of my normal range and I just didn't feel right. But sometimes you're sitting there going, am I wrong? Is this really what I think? And you may sit there for minutes and minutes questioning yourself. You know, you need to ask Mrs. McClure or Dr. Paul, or if you're with Dr. Ritz and say, I don't, the heart rate sounds weird to me. Cause I can tell you the dog that arrested, what I heard right before arrest was his heart sped up and slowed down and sped up and then stopped. That's a completely abnormal, I mean, a dog's heart rate should almost be like, I don't know if you guys know what a metronome is, but in music, it goes tick, 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 
It's a beat. So when I'm listening to a dog or a cat's heart rate and I'm monitoring, it's almost like an internal beat. And then all of a sudden it goes, boop, 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 and you're like, whoa. Like you were all of a sudden on like a nice, it'd be like if you were listening to a record and someone scratched your record and you're like, whoa, because you were kind of like getting into the song and it was like, oh yeah. And then, ugh. It's a hard thing for me to explain, but like when I heard that, I was like, what's going on with this dog? This is weird. Now, I could not see the ECG. I could not, I was not in surgery, but just hearing it from where I was standing, I was like, that's not right. That's not normal. So if you, now the problem is you guys don't have a mental database built up enough of what's right and what's wrong. I mean, some of you have experience, but some of you, this will be your very first time being in there. But that's why you want to read up the night before and you want to review your monitoring notes so you have some information of like, okay, my heart rate should be this, my respiration rate should be this, my SpO2. So when things are normal, then you, you know, and you guys are, you know, your little monitoring cheat sheet. I think you guys did one for surgical nursing. You know, you can have that in your pocket or on your clipboard or on with your papers. I mean, we want you to have something to refer to. So it's not like you have to commit this to memory, but I can tell, again, I can tell someone that's prepared versus and then they just are not as familiar with it but they at least prepared versus someone that completely just showed up out of the blue didn't review the night before i mean i just remember doing anesthesia for cases and reading the night before just reviewing because you know the big part of it is paying attention so when i got into this lecture not like i'm going to re-lecture the whole thing but you know the human error is where where do we play in okay now i think that dog that arrested and dr ritz thought that it had some potential cardiac like an arrhythmia and listening to the heart what it did now again i was not in front of the ecg and mcclure had said it had been normal before that but you know so there's there are patients you can do everything right <laughs> You can do everything right and, you know, you have a patient factor. So it's not always human error, but what can we do? You know, so you have to look at in this situation, you know, do we go, do we get adequate training? Well, and I can say I've given you as much as I can in class. I've tried to give you scenarios. I've tried to give you tips. I've tried to give you checklists. You're going to get to do two procedures, I believe, of anesthesia. So hopefully the second one, you're gonna be much more familiar than when you did the first one. Um, lack of familiarity equipment with agents. That is on you to make sure that you review how to work the machine. And like I told you guys, you have a protocol sheet. If you have a dog spay, you know you have a canine, I would look at every drug on that canine list and put a few, jot down a few notes. Now, one is Rimadyl and one is like antibiotics, but primarily you guys are gonna use like Dextomator, uh, Propofol, Butorphanol, Isoflurane or Sevoflurane you can the night before write some notes about those drugs to make sure you review your machine and you review the drugs. Now history, we are challenged with our patients there because they come from the shelter. Um, unless there were rescues, sometimes we don't. And even with rescues, people lie about why they surrender dogs. So sometimes you don't know the full picture, but you should get a physical and be there for that. Make sure, and you're going to have to look at the lab work. So you're going to probably want to review your CBC and your chemistry notes about, you know, what if your dog has a low PCV? That was the other question from the um, discussion board was like, why do we check a PCV? 
Now, some people, I want to say, some people were like it was to check hemoglobin. You were kind of on the right track. I kind of know. I think I gave you partial stop. I think I gave you partial credit. But you are checking to see how many red blood cells you have. That's Now, if you are missing red blood cells because they're anemic, then you're not going to have as much hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen. So in anemic patients, you have to watch oxygenation. So the test does not test for hemoglobin. It tests for red blood cells. So I, like I said, I think a lot of you were on the right track, but that's what I was looking for with that question was, you know, I'm trying to think what was the other question. I don't, I got to pull up the um, thing. But let me go back to this. Your drug calculations are going to be checked. You are not going to give an animal any medication until it's checked. So, like, even, even if Dr. Ritz checks your math, you can be great at math, but did you draw up the right amount? So, math is only one part of it. You also have to be able to pull up the right amount in a syringe. So, you want to do that. And then, this is where, are you too tired? Are you going too fast? Are you not paying attention? And for you guys... This is another issue that I see students have when they first go in surgery, is they are obsessed with making the anesthetic, anesthetic record perfect and making sure it's filled out properly. First thing you wanna do is fill out as much of the anesthetic record while the animal is being pre-medded or beforehand. You can put the patient name, date, drugs that you calculated once they are approved, you can fill out a lot of the anesthetic record ahead of time. I always filled mine out when my patients were chilling with their pre-meds. I'd pre-med them, and then I'd go set up my machines, I'd get my catheter ready, I'd draw up the, my induction, I'd fill out my anesthetic record, because I've had a lot of people with a blank anesthetic record doing induction, but I'm like, there's a lot of this information you knew beforehand, okay? Because you get so obsessed with filling out that record that sometimes you gotta just look at your patient. I've had patients give me grief and sometimes, I mean, the anesthetic record is a legal document. Stop it, you're embarrassing me. The anesthetic record is legal. So I'm not saying that you don't want to not fill it out, but always make sure that you have to do it in a timely manner so that you're looking at your patient and you're looking at your record, okay? So both need to be done, but don't get too obsessed. And remember, you always take a heart rate right after induction first before a temperature. Don't like I said, I don't care what their temperature is right after induction. As long as you get it within a five, 10 minute period after induction, you're gonna be fine. Always check a pulse very first thing. Um, and then obviously setting up the equipment wrong. I think in the lecture, I wanna stress this point because a lot of people, they leak test the machine and they twist the pop off closed to check for a leak, which is proper but then they forget to open the pop-off back up after they check it. Well, then if you go to induce and hook up your patient and your pop-off is closed, it could be missed and you don't wanna blow up their lungs or stop their heart. So whenever I'm done leak testing, I open everything back up so that I'm not worried about the pop-off. PRT, I like that. PRT, not TPR. Yeah. Um, I. I can't remember if you guys got to meet um, Jory Wood, Miss Wood, Mrs. Wood, before you left, but she was in surgery and she used to tell students PRT or, you know, she goes, don't, oh, do your part. Oh, I like that. I mean, their temperature is going to drop. They're anesthetized, and it's not going to drop in five minutes dramatically. So I'm, that's why, but 
Remember, I said most anesthetic emergencies happen in the first 20 minutes of anesthesia and on recovery. I mean, when that, dad, when that dog unfortunately passed in surgery, she was closing. So that was kind of towards the end of the procedure. So, I mean, we always have to be kind of on guard, but the induction period has a lot of things to be aware of. So I'm always kind of like throwing my hand on their heart. Um, I'm trying to think another question from, oh, I added the last question. Now, I don't think I took off really any points for the last question, but it says, what is the first thing you do when your patient goes into cardiac arrest during anesthesia? Turn off your vaporizer. Now, in that scenario, I'm assuming that the patient is intubated already because they're it's in surgery. So I'm assuming you already have an airway. You already have a patent airway. Because normally, it's airway, breathing, chest compressions. You've got to get an airway. But if we already have the airway, then we can start with the breathing and the chest compressions. But a lot of times, if you start bagging them and doing chest compressions and you've not turned off the isoflurane, you're keeping them asleep, okay? So what, what I like to do is disconnect them or like turn off the iso. I flush out the system with like the flush valve, get any anesthetic out, hook them back up, and then you start bagging them because your bag and your breathing system has a little bit of residual um, gas so if I start doing CPR, you want to try to be doing that with pure oxygen. Um, I'm trying to think what my other question was on that. Let me, actually, let me see. Okay, so I think I had the four anesthetic problems. I had two examples of human error, which, you know, are examples being rushed, not checking drugs, not being prepared. Um, I did, why do we assess PCV? And what's the first thing you do? Okay. And does anybody have an, an, a question based on anything? Because this is quite lengthy for me to like re-lecture. I'm trying to hit some high points. But is there anything that you had a question about? Um, yeah, this was a longer one. And guys, and I didn't want to create confusion. And I'm sorry because... It wasn't till I recorded, I was recording the second one and I had some stuff with my son earlier, so I had to record that one later. But I decided to leave, I'll do CPR um, and recovery next week. Um, so that's why I dropped it off of the homework and stuff. But for each of these categories, there are some indications and one thing that I want to mention about obese animals, because I, I've had people get this wrong on the test, and I want to make sure that everybody understands. If you have a 100-pound dog come in, and you kind of have to guesstimate, you're like, you're probably supposed to be an 80-pound lab, not a 100-pound lab. I am going to calculate my anesthetic agents for an 80-pound dog. Now... When I have asked you guys on tests several times, I said, how do I pick my dosage mix per kg of propofol? And I have a lot of people tell me weight. Weight, once I pick a dosage, then I calculate based on ideal weight. But let me give you an example. Propofol, okay, I've got Bo behind me now, okay? Say he's gonna get neutered. And propofol is, and say he's, 100 pounds and he's supposed to be 60 pounds. Oh my God. Um, say I want to pick his propofol four to eight mix per kg. Okay. 
the, when I pick propofol 48 mix per kg, that's like, are they excitable? Is it a long procedure? Are they healthy? Do they have underlying conditions? Is blood work normal? Okay. Once I decide, okay, I'm going to choose six mix per kg, then I'm going to calculate the dose based on their ideal weight. But weight doesn't apply really to my dosage in mix per kg. Mix per kg, again, temperament is a huge one and route because say he was aggressive. I know I have to go IM, so I have to use a higher dosage. If I'm going to go IV, I can use a lower dosage. But what tells me my route? A lot of time it's the temperament. I mean, if they're aggressive, I'm probably not going to be able to hold them for a catheter. I'm probably going to have to use an IM protocol versus an IV protocol. And whenever I use an IM dosage, it's always higher than an IV dosage. And a lot of these guys, the other thing that I kept saying is that there's certain drugs that, well, let me give, let me go, let me say neo, no, let me do geriatrics. So for a geriatric patient, Age is not a disease, but you know, the liver's older, kidneys older, heart's older. Usually their muscles, they have a little bit of like, hang on, he's getting in there. How did you get that? Um, when I have an animal that's older, you can have very healthy geriatric patients. And I want to say it was Nick, and if I don't know if some of you guys know Nick, um, that was in the old March class and he's on it. He's got glasses. He was bald and he adopted Rusty. I think Rusty was an old, old pity. I don't know if you guys got to meet Rusty. Um, Rusty just went in and had a mass removal. And so Nick was messaging me because he's on externship there and he was doing anesthesia. And I said, well, for Rusty, his blood work was completely normal. And he's very slow. I'm like, that is a dog that will sleep all day. I would use, they were going to use ACE, butorphanol, propofol, ISO. And I said, I would just give a quarter to a half of a normal ACE dose because you can always give more. I said, if you err on the side of it's too low, just give them more. But ACE is not reversible. So when you use acepromazine, you have to you have to just stick with the side effects. So whatever are the side effects, you're stuck. So why not give a lower dose? And he said it was fine. He said Rusty did great. Blood pressure was great. Uh, heart rate was good. Um, so what I think about in geriatrics is I usually use lower doses. Not that you can't use acepromazine. And like, let me bring up a point about the liver patients. Yes, um, if they're underweight, probably. If they're underweight, well, let me put it this way. It depends on why they're underweight. Underweight has a lot of, mm, what am I trying to say? There's a lot of reasons <coughs> behind being underweight and some may be that the animal has too high of a metabolism. Like hyperthyroid animals are underweight, but because they're hyperthyroid, I usually go with normal or higher dosing because they're in a, like my old cat was hyperthyroid and she was very unruly. Where you might have a dog that has cancer that's underweight and it kind of still, I kind of still look at their temperament and the underlying disease process. I don't know if that makes sense. But let me go back, let me go to, where is? Can 
I find liver. Well, I know we're almost done, so I wanna. Um, when a patient has liver disease, and that could be hepatitis, liver cancer, could be a shunt. Um, so it kind of depends on the liver disease. And obviously this is up to your doctor, but the liver is responsible for a lot of these drugs and breaking them down into what's called an inactive metabolite. So if a dog gets ketamine, ketamine goes to the liver, it's broken down and it's rendered inactive some goes to the bile, some goes to the kidney, and is urinated out. In the dog, it's about 50% liver, 50% kidney, okay? So if I have a dog that has liver disease and their liver is not capable of doing that job of breaking that ketamine down, then my concern is there's gonna be active ketamine circulating, right? Because if it doesn't get cleared, if it doesn't get broken down, it stays actively circulating. So the consequence of having animals that have liver or kidney disease is that sometimes these drugs have a profound or a longer effect in your patient. So if you have Mrs. Smith, or say you have Mrs. Landeros, and she's being super annoying, and she's like, is Bo ready to go? Like, what time is Bo ready to be picked up? Can I come get Bo? And if you know, you may have a prolonged recovery where normally if Bo was normal, you know, Bo might be able to go home at two o'clock, but it might be five or six o'clock. So you have to kind of think about that. And again, if ACE is your only sedative and you're like, Ms. Landero said, don't use ACE in this dog or whatever. If it's your only drug that you have to give, you may just use a really low dose. So, you know, again, when you guys are first out there, your doctor's going to say, we're giving this, this, this to our patients. You're not necessarily prescribing it, but you're using these drugs and you're talking to these clients after the fact. Okay. And that's the other reason I want you to understand these drugs is because when I have dogs on acepromazine or if they go home after sedation, um, remember ACE is a drug that makes them act a little, takes away inhibition and then they go home and, you know, little Sally and Tommy are like, oh, Bo's home, Bo's home, yay. And Bo is like under the influence. I have to tell the owner, I always tell them, I'm like, if you've got little kids at home, you got to put the dog in a dark room, in a separate area, keep it quiet. Don't let them play with the dog because when the dog is under the influence of these sedatives, they may not act themselves. And I don't want little Sally or Tommy or whoever to potentially get bit. Whether the client listens to or you, that's not your fault. At least you inform them of the risk and then it's upon them to listen to your recommendations. Okay, so I brought up you know, what I'm going to try to do um, over the weekend is maybe put together um, a little bit of a, just a study guide for this. I know you guys worked on questions out of the book, you know, but, you know, there was main things to be looked at with these categories. Um, and then the other thing, these are what I call your high risk patients. They pose a risk walking in the door to anesthesia, or they give you a challenge right off the bat. But then what I think I want to review on Monday is, so all of this is like, what do you do if you have a patient with renal disease, liver disease, obese, pediatric, geriatric, cardiac patient, respiratory patient? Because again, not every patient walks in the door 100% normal for anesthesia. So how do we treat these patients? Like I told you guys from day one, I can have a six-month-old bulldog walk in for a spay. Now a spay is an elective procedure. They're six months old. If that's a German Shepherd, that's what's called an elective procedure. 
excellent condition. A bulldog right off the bat is a good patient. They're already out of excellent category because they come with baggage is the best way I can say it. So I know before I even talk to the owner, meet the patient, put a stethoscope on that dog, I'm already formulating a plan in my head. And like I said in the video, and it, it sounds morbid, is that I think about how can I kill the patient, which is obviously not my goal, but then I, I work the problem backwards. This is what'll happen, this will kill my patient if I do this, this, or this. To prevent it, I do this, this, and this. So then I already have kind of like a problem list, and I already have a plan of how can I hopefully prevent that from happening. Um, what I want to focus on Monday is that, you know, it goes through C-sections, trauma, um, and then it gets into, where is it? I think it's around slide 35. It gets into responding to problems. And on slide 37, there is a big list of what are the problems that we see during surgery. Okay, and I, this is where I started video two. So what I think I'll do is I'll go over on, I think Monday we will have a Zoom. The, like the last two days I've just done the test on Monday and not Zoomed, but we'll do a review and then I'll open the test up like I've done before, right after the Zoom, there'll be a test opening and then I'll start the new stuff, if that makes sense. Do you have any questions from the video, the homework? Any questions in general? Is everyone live out there? Hello. Literally, they just jumped on my couch to lay down and I'm seriously done with Zoom. Oh my God, kind of alive. Everybody hang in there. I know you guys are like to the max, but I'm gonna try to turn this so you can see what the heck. I don't know if you can even make out that they're, oh. laying next to each other. AJ, Bo, what are you doing? No, mommy's done now. We don't have to lay down. Oh my God, look at them. I know they're absolutely adorable, but what the, like, sorry. What the heck? Like, it's on cue, I'm done talking, and now they're laying down. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, hang in there if you guys need anything. Like I said, I'm hoping week eight kind of summarizes everything for everybody. And um, helps it make sense. Okay, well, if you don't have any questions, unless I... All right, well, I will just, um, I'll get caught up. I'll get those exotics. I'm, like I said, I'm hoping to... Now that they're laying down, probably start doing some grading while they're in here with me. Um, and I'll see you guys on Monday for Zoom. Have a good weekend. And I'll post this link. Uh, it's been taking my computer forever to get these videos loaded. So, all right. Have a good weekend. Bye.